Presented here is a curated summary of Aristotle's most celebrated work, the Nicomachean Ethics, woven together from the book's most significant direct quotations. May it serve as a beacon in your quest for eudaimonia. The Golden Mean To lead a balanced life, one must aim for the mean or the middle path. This involves recognizing the extremes that threaten this balance. Among the extremes, like excess and deficiency, one often poses a greater risk than the other. Recognizing and avoiding the more significant threat first is essential, as it's challenging to tackle both at once. A practical approach to achieving this balance is to assess one's natural inclinations. If one tends to lean towards one extreme, consciously moving in the opposite direction can help find equilibrium. This journey towards the mean isn't straightforward. One may sometimes veer towards excess and at other times towards deficiency. However, such deviations should not be a cause for concern. They are steps towards the eventual goal of balance. Achieving this balance, especially in moral contexts, isn't simple. Virtue pertains to how we react emotionally and how we act. In every emotion and action, there's a possibility of excess, deficiency, or the right measure. The challenge is to feel and act at the right time, in the right measure, and for the right reasons. Moreover, errors in judgment or action can manifest in countless ways, since mistakes often have varied paths. In contrast, the right choice usually follows a singular, correct path. Achieving this correctness or virtue requires one to find the mean between extremes. As a guiding principle, it's worth noting, goodness is consistent and singular in its manifestation, while errors can appear in countless forms. Achieving the golden mean, or mastering virtue, is by no means an easy task. However, it's crucial to understand that straying sometimes towards excess, and at other times towards deficiency, should not be discouraging. Indeed, this very deviation is the path to achieving that balance or mean. I am particularly referring to moral virtue, as it is tied closely to our passions and actions. In these areas of life, there's excess, deficiency, and the middle ground. Consider this. One might feel fear, display courage, experience desire, anger, compassion, or even general pleasure or displeasure. All these feelings can vary in intensity. Neither extreme of these feelings is advisable. Yet feeling them at the right moment, in relation to the right matters, with the right people, for the right reasons, and in the right manner, that is the golden mean. It embodies excellence and is intrinsically linked to virtue. Similarly, in our actions, there's excess, deficiency, and the middle ground. Virtue pertains to both our passions and actions. In these, excess is a mistake and is criticized, as is deficiency, while the middle ground is praised and seen as the right course. Thus, virtue is a form of moderation, always aiming for that balanced middle. Virtue is a quality we freely choose. It's like the middle ground in our behavior, but this middle is personal and relative to each of us. This balance is guided by common sense, especially the kind that wise people use. It's a balance between two mistakes, doing too much or too little. Yet, this idea of balance doesn't fit every action or feeling. Some emotions or actions like spite, shamelessness, envy, or acts like stealing and killing are just bad. We can't find a right amount for them. Finding the right balance in any aspect isn't easy. For example, finding the exact center of a circle isn't for everyone, only experts. Similarly, anyone can get angry, but knowing who to get angry with, for the right reason, in the right time, and in the right manner, that is hard. Another example is that everyone can spend money, but to know how much money to spend, when, why, and in what way, that's tricky. That's why making the right choice is rare, praiseworthy, and commendable. So if you're aiming for balance, start by avoiding the extremes. One extreme might be worse than the other. Since maintaining balance is challenging, a wise approach is to opt for the lesser of two evils. This approach mostly works in the way we've talked about. We should also recognize our natural tendencies. Everyone has their own leanings, things they like or dislike. So we should try to pull ourselves in the opposite direction of our negative tendencies. The more we distance ourselves from these errors, the closer we come to achieving balance. Think of it like straightening a bent piece of wood. The proper way of life. There are three primary ways of life. One centered on pleasures, another dedicated to service to the city, and a third devoted to study and research. Refined thinkers and men of action tend to favor honor. 
This is, indeed, roughly the end goal of a life in service to the city. However, such an end seems too external and superficial to be the focus of our investigation. Commonly, honor is perceived as something that depends more on those who bestow it than on the recipient. Yet we believe that the true good is something personal to us, something not easily taken away. Many seek honor to reassure themselves of their goodness. They desire recognition from those with wisdom and those who truly know them. They want the honor they receive to be tied to their virtue, indicating that they view virtue as superior. Eudaimonia is an action, not a stable state. Note, for Aristotle, eudaimonia describes the highest human good. It represents the ultimate goal of human life, achieved when one lives according to reason and virtue. It's not merely about pleasure or happiness, but living in alignment with one's true nature and realizing one's full potential. End of note. On the sacred island of Delos, a renowned inscription reads, The most just is the most beautiful. Health is the best. The most pleasant of all is to possess what one loves. However, these three qualities should not be viewed in isolation. Eudaimonia requires study and personal effort. Eudaimonia also necessitates external goods. It's challenging, if not impossible, to perform noble and beautiful actions without the support of external resources. Many deeds require the assistance of friends, wealth, or political power, all of which serve as tools. It's improbable for someone with an extremely unattractive appearance, or of humble origin, or who is solitary and childless, to achieve great happiness. The odds diminish further if one has ill-behaved children or friends, or if one had good children and friends, but lost them to death. No eudaimonic person can ever become miserable, for he will never engage in disgusting and worthless actions. The truly good and wise individual knows how to endure all the vicissitudes of fortune with dignity, and always does, within given circumstances, the best. Just as a good general knows how to make the best military use of the army at his disposal, and just as a shoemaker knows how to craft a beautiful shoe from the leathers provided to him, so do all other craftsmen. Virtue is won by habits, Individual ethical virtues are achieved through the repetition of corresponding actions. In other words, you become virtuous by habitually performing virtuous acts. This contrasts with Plato, who believed that mere knowledge and contact with the ideal are sufficient to motivate a person. Thus, we rightly say that a person becomes just through repeated just actions, or that a person becomes temperate through repeated temperate actions. A person who does not consistently perform these actions will never acquire these virtues. However, most people, instead of acting this way, take refuge in theories and imagine that by philosophizing, they will become virtuous. In reality, they act like patients who listen attentively to their doctors, but do not follow any of their instructions. Just as those patients will not regain their physical health with such a treatment, these individuals will never find the health of their soul with this kind of philosophy. In the case of habits, we are only masters of their beginnings, and the gradual progress is not noticeable, as is the case with illnesses. The true measure of having internalized a virtue is if its practice brings us happiness. Definition of virtue. Virtue is neither a passion nor a power. It is a habit, a habit that aims at the mean. Virtue is a habit that A, is freely chosen by the individual, and B, is located in our own relative mean. This mean is determined by the reasoning of the prudent person. Temperance and how to acquire it. By systematically staying away from pleasures, we become temperate, and once we are, we can largely avoid them. The same is true for courage. By gradually getting used to despising things that cause fear and confronting them, we become courageous, and once we are, we can largely face them. A temperate person is one who does not grieve over the absence of pleasant things and for abstaining from them. Conversely, a temperate person does not feel sorrow when these things are missing, nor does he desire them excessively. He desires them moderately. He does not desire them more than he should, nor at inappropriate times. However, he will desire pleasant things that contribute to health or good physical condition moderately and in the right way. The same goes for other pleasant things if they do not obstruct in the way mentioned, and if they do not conflict with moral beauty and do not exceed one's means. People indifferent to these terms love such pleasures more than they should. However, a temperate person is not such an individual, but one who acts as right reason dictates. Above all, we must guard ourselves against pleasure and hedonism, because we are biased judges against them. 
Therefore, we must lean away from pleasure, and if we manage to drive away pleasure, our mistakes and errors will be fewer. Moderation in Desires Strong and overpowering desires can render our logic ineffective. Hence, desires should be kept moderate and limited, ensuring they never conflict with reason. Just as a child should follow the guidance of a tutor, the desiring part within us should adhere to the directives of reason. The desires of a temperate individual harmonize with their logical side. Such a person desires what is appropriate, when it's appropriate, and in the manner it should be, all in alignment with reason. Moral Beauty Actions rooted in virtue are inherently beautiful and are pursued for their inherent beauty. The willingness of a generous individual to give stems from the beauty of the act itself. Such a person gives rightly, to those deserving, in the amount they deserve, and when they deserve it. Furthermore, this generous act is performed with pleasure and without regret. Any action in line with virtue is pleasant and devoid of sorrow. However, giving to those undeserving or for reasons other than the beauty of the act is not generosity, but something else. The worthy or magnanimous person will also build and equip his house as is appropriate to his wealth, for the house is also an ornament. A characteristic of the magnanimous person is to spend preferably on works that will last for a long time, because these are the most beautiful, and in each particular case to spend what is appropriate, for the same things are not fitting to both gods and men, as in the case of a temple and a grave. The one who goes to excess and is tasteless exceeds measure by spending contrary to what is appropriate. In small cases of expenditure, he spends a lot and makes a tasteless and unesthetic display. For instance, setting a lavish table for a simple charity event or extravagantly sponsoring a comedic performance. Such actions stem not from an appreciation of beauty, but from a desire to show off his wealth, and because he imagines that with all this, he will gain the admiration of the world. And where he should spend a lot, he spends little, while where he should spend little, he spends a lot. The person who has a great soul, we shall call magnanimous. Magnanimous, according to common perception, is one who deems themselves worthy of great things, and genuinely is. Someone who overestimates their worth without the merit to back it, is seen as foolish, but no virtuous person is silly or mindless. For the person who is worthy of small things and considers himself as such is indeed modest, but not magnanimous. For magnanimity concerns greatness, just as beauty relates to a tall and large body. Short people may be graceful and proportionate, but they are not beautiful. A person who considers himself worthy of great things when he isn't is vain. Often, those who are arrogant and offensive possess the blessings we've discussed. However, without genuine virtue, they struggle to handle these blessings gracefully. Their mismanagement leads to a misplaced sense of superiority, causing them to mistreat others. They might mimic the magnanimous but fall short, often resorting to criticism. In contrast, a genuinely magnanimous individual has a valid basis for their judgments, rooted in sound reasoning. Many others, however, judge without proper understanding or insight. The magnanimous is not a person of small dangers, nor does he love dangers. The reason is that he values honor for only the right and few things. However, he is a person of great dangers, and when faced with danger, he doesn't consider his life at all believing that some circumstances make life not worth living. It also seems that magnanimous people remember the good they have done, but not the good they have received. When such a person interacts with people of high social status and those favored by fortune, he maintains a dignified and imposing stance, while with average people, he is simple and moderate. He is also not vengeful, as it doesn't suit the magnanimous to dwell on past grievances. It's more fitting for him to overlook them. He avoids gossip. He neither talks about himself nor others, because he's neither interested in hearing praise for himself nor criticisms of others. He's also not flattered with praises. Primarily, the magnanimous is related to honors, as we've already said. However, he will behave moderately towards wealth, power, and any good or bad fortune that comes his way. And neither in his good fortune will he reach excessive joy, nor in his bad fortune excessive sorrow. On the subject of prudence, also known as phrenesis, and how it differs from philosophical wisdom. From our previous discussions, it's evident that philosophical wisdom encompasses both scientific knowledge 
and an intuitive understanding of the most significant valuable things. This is why figures like Anaxagoras and Thales are deemed wise, but not necessarily prudent. People perceive them as unaware of their own best interests, suggesting they possess knowledge of unique, admirable, and divine matters, but these matters are deemed irrelevant to human well-being. Prudence, on the other hand, deals with human affairs and things that can be contemplated. The primary role of a prudent person is to think correctly. However, one doesn't ponder immutable things or those without a purpose. Prudence also concerns itself with both general and specific matters. Most importantly, it is related to actions, which are contingent on specific circumstances. It should be noted that one's personal well-being cannot be isolated from the well-being of their household and state. A testament to our earlier points is that while young people can become mathematicians or philosophers, it's rare to find a young person who is deemed prudent in the conventional sense. The reason is that prudence deals with specifics, which are known through experience. Youth lacks this experience, as it's the passage of time that grants it. Philosophical wisdom doesn't concern itself with things that can make a person achieve eudaimonia since it doesn't focus on any form of genesis. It does not lead to actions or creations. Prudence is the intellectual virtue that deals with what's just, beautiful, and good for humans. These are precisely the things humans are naturally inclined to do. Merely knowing them doesn't make us more capable of doing them, especially since virtues are habits. Just as mere knowledge about health doesn't make us healthier, knowing about virtues doesn't necessarily make us virtuous. We aren't more capable of health-related actions just by knowing medicine or physical training. The prudent person seeks the absence of sorrow. Also, pleasures are an obstacle to prudence, and the greater the pleasure they cause, the greater the obstacle. The work of man reaches its most perfect realization only in accordance with prudence and moral virtue. Virtue ensures we have the correct intentions, while prudence indicates the means that lead to the realization of these goals. Wickedness distorts us and makes us deceive ourselves regarding the principles of action. It is therefore clear that it is impossible to be a prudent person without being good. The same person cannot be prudent and intemperate at the same time, because a prudent person is morally good at the same time. Moreover, to be prudent, it is not enough to only know what is right. One must also be able to do it, and the intemperate person cannot do it. Nothing, however, prevents the clever person from being intemperate. In any case, the intemperate person is neither bad nor unjust. Intemperance and excess. The fact that people use words and expressions akin to those that come from knowledge is not proof that they actually possess knowledge. Even those under the influence of certain passions might present scientific proofs or recite verses of Empedocles. And people who have just started learning a science list its various propositions one after the other but they do not yet have knowledge of this science, because it must become in reality a part of themselves, but this takes time. Therefore, we must consider that intemperate people speak just like actors. We label someone as intemperate if they, without desire or with weak desire, pursue excessive pleasures and avoid moderate sorrows. Like dogs that bark at the mere sound from outside before even recognizing if the visitor is a friend, so does anger, due to its impetuosity and haste. It listens to reason but doesn't truly hear the command it gives, and thus rushes to retaliate. Anger obeys reason to a degree, but desire does not. Hence, desire is more shameful than anger. The intemperate person succumbs to desire, not reason. Although the intemperate might not be fundamentally unjust, they can still engage in unjust behaviors. The intemperate individual is inclined to chase bodily pleasures to an extreme, not out of conviction, but due to their nature. In contrast, the wicked or malevolent person genuinely believes in pursuing such pleasures, driven by their inherent disposition. While the intemperate can be swayed and alter their perspective, the wicked remain steadfast in their ways. The wicked are worse than the intemperate. One is a case of softness, the other is licentious. The licentious person has no tendency for remorse. The reason is that he remains firm in his preference and choice. On the contrary, the intemperate is full of regrets. However, no logical argument changes the minds of the stubborn, because they are prone to desires, and many of them are driven and behave by pleasures. Stubborn people are the idiosyncratic, the ignorant, and the unpolished. It is a common belief that a person who loves pleasure and entertainment is licentious, but in reality, he is a soft person. 
because games and entertainment are just relaxation, as they are a form of rest. However, the person who loves pleasure and entertainment is a person who exceed the limits in this respect. On the subject of pleasures, pleasures are indeed desirable and worthy of choice, but not those that come from certain kinds of things, just as wealth is desirable, but not as a reward for betrayal. Some are pleasures that come from beautiful things, and others are those that come from ugly things. One cannot feel the pleasure of justice if one is not just, just as one cannot feel the pleasure of music if one is not musical, and so on. This can also be made clear from the close relationship between each pleasure and the activity that perfects it. Those who, in any particular field, act with pleasure are the best judges and the most accurate connoisseurs. For example, those who find pleasure in geometry become good at it. So the pleasure that is inherent in virtuous activity is good, and that which is inherent in a lesser value activity is bad. It is therefore clear that pleasures commonly deemed shameful should not be classified as pleasures at all. They are pleasures only for the corrupted. To strive and endure hardships for the sake of entertainment is foolish, something completely childish. However, seeking entertainment to rejuvenate oneself for serious work is considered appropriate. Entertainment serves as a form of rest, and since one cannot be constantly engaged in strenuous activities, rest is essential. Rest is not an end in itself, but is sought for the sake of action. By common conception, a blessed life is a life in accordance with virtue, but this is a life accompanied by effort and serious occupations, not a life of seeking pleasures. On the subject of friendship, there are three types of friendships, those driven by shared enjoyment, mutual advantages, or a bond over common virtues. Friendships of virtue are naturally rare, the reason is that there are only a few people of this kind. Moreover, this type of friendship requires time and an atmosphere of mutual familiarity. As the saying goes, people cannot truly know each other unless they have shared bread and salt together. It's also impossible for one to accept the other and become friends unless one is deemed worthy of love by the other and earns the other's trust. Those who quickly show signs of friendship to each other certainly want to be friends, but they aren't unless they are worthy of love. While the desire for friendship can arise quickly, true friendship does not. With friendship divided into these types, lower quality individuals will become friends for the sake of pleasure or benefit, being similar in this respect. In contrast, good people will become friends because of their inherent goodness. Their friendship, based on virtue, is focused on doing good for one another. This is the distinctive characteristic of virtue and friendship. Since these people reciprocate in this matter, there's no room for complaints and quarrels. How can you be angry with someone who loves you and does good for you? Even in friendships formed for pleasure, there are no complaints among friends, as both get what they desire at the same time. It would be absurd for someone to complain about another not being pleasant when they can easily choose not to spend time with them. However, friendships formed for the sake of benefit give rise to many complaints. As the relationship between the two friends is based on benefit, each always demands the larger share and feels they get less than they should, resulting in accusations that they don't receive what they deserve, even though they are worthy of it. The friendship between a man and a woman seems to be natural, because humans naturally tend more towards pairing than living with others in a city, just as the family precedes the city. Children are considered a bond. This is why childless couples separate more quickly. In all types of friendships between dissimilar people, Proportionality in the things exchanged between them creates and preserves the friendship. Disputes arise among friends when each one gets something different from their friendship and not what they desire. Because it's as if they get nothing when they don't get what they desire. Is the most desirable thing for friends to spend their hours and days together? Yes, because friendship is companionship and communication. And whatever relationship one has with oneself, they have the same with their friend. Being aware of one's own existence and valuing it is a natural feeling. Similarly, recognizing and valuing the existence of a friend is equally important. This mutual recognition and appreciation are strengthened when friends spend time together. Naturally, people desire such shared experiences. When a lover loves his beloved for pleasure and the other for benefit, this friendship dissolves when the purposes of their friendly relationship are not fulfilled because neither loved or befriended the other for what they were, but for the qualities they had. 
qualities that are not permanent. However, friendships based on character itself last, as we have already said. One could argue that during the time the other loved him for the benefit or for pleasure, he pretended to love him for his character. Because, as we said at the beginning, many disputes arise among friends when they are not friends for the reason they believe they are. So when one deceives oneself and comes to believe that his friend loves him for his character, while the other showed nothing of the sort, he should blame only himself. However, when deceived by the other's pretense, he is right to blame the one who deceived him. In friendships, like attracts like, should we be quick to dissolve a friendship? Perhaps not in all cases, but only when the other is incurably bad. We should offer those who have the potential for improvement help, more help that we would offer for the salvation of their property. And this is because the former shows greater kindness and is more related to the essence of friendship. But if one friend remains the same while the other becomes better and eventually far surpasses the first in virtue, can the second continue to be friends with the first? Surely this is not possible. The virtuous person likes spending time with himself because this is something he does with pleasure. The memory of his past actions is pleasant and his expectations and predictions for his future actions are good, making them enjoyable. His mind is full of thoughts. He also shares his sorrows and joys primarily with himself. Each of us is nothing more than our mind. Therefore, the worthy and virtuous person loves this part of himself primarily. The wicked people seek companions to pass the time and avoid being alone with themselves. This is because, when alone, they recall many unpleasant actions they did in the past, knowing at the same time that they will commit similar ones in the future. But when with others, they forget them. Having nothing lovable within them, they have no friendly feelings for themselves nor do they share joys and sorrows with themselves. Therefore, if this state of affairs is exceptionally vile, one must do everything possible to avoid wickedness and strive to be a good person. For then, he will have a friendly relationship with himself and can be a friend to someone else. A virtuous person's relationship with his friend is like his relationship with himself, because a friend is another version of ourselves. It seems that goodwill is the beginning of a friendship, just as the pleasure one feels when seeing someone is the beginning of love. No one falls in love if they haven't first enjoyed seeing the other person's appearance. But the one who enjoys the sight of another's form and is not yet in love, he will be in love when he misses them in their absence and desires their presence. In the same way, people cannot be friends if they were not well disposed towards each other. However, those who are well disposed towards someone are not yet his friends. The reason is that they only want what is good for that person, but they are not willing to do anything with him, or undergo hardships for him. On Benefactors According to common perception, benefactors love the recipients of their kindness more than the recipients love their benefactors. This happens because offering love is an active act, while receiving it is passive. This is why mothers love their children more. Giving birth requires more effort. This also applies to benefactors. If all people competed with each other in beauty and put all their strength into doing what is most beautiful, then our communities would thrive in their ideal state. Each person would possess the highest goodness, for virtue is the paramount good. To conclude, the virtuous person should be self-loving because by doing morally beautiful actions, he benefits himself and others. While the bad person should not be, he will harm both himself and others as he follows his bad passions. The bad person has a discrepancy between what he should do and what he actually does, while the virtuous person does what he should. The reason is that the mind always chooses what is best for itself, and the virtuous person obeys the mind. It is also true that the virtuous person does a lot for his friends and his homeland, and that, if necessary, he gives his life for them. He would also sacrifice his money and honors in seeking to gain beauty for himself. Such a person would prefer to live a year with beauty rather than many years in an insignificant and random way. He would prefer a beautiful action of great value over many of little value. And these people would sacrifice their money if their friends were to acquire more. Because, while in this way the friend gets money, he himself gains beauty, thus offering himself a greater good. Therefore, he is rightly considered a good person, as he prefers beauty over everything else. It is also possible to even delegate the execution of some good actions to his friend. Giving his friend the opportunity to do something virtuous may be more beautiful than doing it himself, 
it is paradoxical to make the happy person solitary. Indeed, no one would prefer to have all the goods of the world if you were to enjoy them alone because man is a being destined to live in the community of the city, which means that nature intended him to live with other people. The same applies to the happy person, as he has all that is naturally good. And it is obviously preferable to spend his hours and days with friends and good people rather than with strangers and random people. Therefore, the happy person really needs friends. As we have said before, eudaimonia is an activity, and being active is something you do, not something static that one possesses. So, when one says, I am eudaimonic, it means I live and act. If the activity of a good person is virtuous and pleasant in itself, then a happy person needs virtuous friends, because his preference is always to observe and study the actions of a virtuous person. However, the life of a solitary and isolated person is difficult. It's not easy to act continuously in isolation. But with others, and in relation to others, it's easier. The activity, which is already pleasant in itself, will then be more continuous. The virtuous person, precisely due to his virtue, rejoices in actions that follow the rules of virtue and is disturbed by actions that arise from wickedness. Living with virtuous people can also become a kind of exercise in virtue, as Theogenes says. Conclusion For a person to be eudaimonic, they need virtuous friends. Regarding the question of how many friends one should have, having a greater number of friends than what is satisfactory for serving the needs of our life is superfluous and constitutes an obstacle to a morally beautiful life. When it comes to the number of friends, there's a limit, perhaps dictated by the largest possible number of people with whom one could coexist, as coexistence is a defining characteristic of friendship. But it's impossible to coexist with many and share oneself with all of them. This is quite evident. They must also be friends among themselves if they are to spend all their hours and days together. This, however, is very difficult to happen among many people. It's also hard to share joys and sorrows in a friendly way with many people, because it's possible to rejoice with one's joy and at the same time be saddened by another's sorrow. Perhaps then, it's best not to seek as many friends as possible, but only as many as are sufficient for coexistence, for it doesn't seem possible to have a strong friendship with many. This is why one cannot be in love with many people. Love is, they say, an exaggeration of friendship, and this presupposes only one person. One should feel satisfied if they find only a few virtuous people for friends. After all, the mere presence of friends is pleasant in both happy and sad moments, for it's a relief for distressed people to have friends share their pain. According to common perception, Virtuous friends become better due to the way they act, but also through the positive influence they exert on each other. Indeed, they uplift each other's characteristics they like. Hence the expression, from the good come good things. When it comes to friends, we choose for the sake of pleasure. Those should be few, just like the seasoning in our food. To conclude on the topic of friendship, eudaimonia is an active state, not a passive possession. A eudaimonic person lives and acts virtuously, and such a person needs virtuous friends to observe and emulate virtuous actions. While solitude makes continuous virtuous action difficult, being with others facilitates it. Virtuous friends not only provide companionship, but also serve as a form of moral training. However, one shouldn't seek an excessive number of friends. Quality matters more than quantity. The presence of friends is comforting in both joy and sorrow. Yet, one should be cautious not to appear ungrateful or unpleasant. Friends influence and uplift each other, emphasizing the importance of surrounding oneself with good individuals. Politics and Justice Those aspiring to master the art of politics must couple their studies with experience. The sophists, who claim to teach this art, clearly lack the capability to do so. They don't even grasp its essence or its core subject. If they did, they wouldn't mistakenly equate it with rhetoric or even deem it inferior to it. Nor would they consider that legislating is an easy task. So how does one become adept at legislating? It's evident that merely reading medical manuals won't make someone a doctor. While such manuals can be beneficial for those with experience, they offer little to the novice. Similarly, collections of laws and constitutions can be invaluable to those equipped to discern their merits and flaws and to understand their applicability in various contexts. However, for those lacking this discernment, 
such collections can at best provide a broader understanding, but not the ability to judge them accurately, unless by sheer luck. The pinnacle of political art is the ultimate good. Its primary objective is to instill a specific quality in citizens, molding them into virtuous individuals capable of performing beautiful actions. At first glance, we deem actions as just if they foster and maintain eudaimonia and its components within society. This form of justice is undeniably the epitome of virtue. However, it's not absolute. It's contextualized by its relation to others. This is why justice is often hailed as the paramount virtue, outshining even the brightest stars. Proverbially, we say, justice encompasses all virtues. Justice represents the zenith of virtue because it's both an embodiment and an application of it. Moreover, it's unique in that it's exercised in relation to others, not just for oneself. Many can exercise virtue for their own sake, but falter when it comes to others. This underscores the wisdom in Beyonce's saying, a position of power will reveal the quality of a man. A ruler interacts with others and is an integral part of society. Hence, justice is often seen as the only virtue that benefits others. It serves the interests of another, be it a ruler or a fellow citizen. Consequently, the most deplorable individual is one who directs his wickedness towards himself and his friends. In contrast, a more commendable individual exercises virtue for the benefit of others, a task undoubtedly challenging. Closing Remarks The best form of education and upbringing is one that instructs us to feel joy and gratitude and sorrow and displeasure, for the right reasons. A eudaimonic life is a life in accordance with virtue. However, this is a life accompanied by effort and serious engagements, not a life of entertainment. Eudaimonia is not found in recreational activities and amusements, but in actions in accordance with virtue. In the realm of actions, the most important thing is not detailed theoretical analysis and knowledge, but much more their actualization. Therefore, for virtue, it is not enough to know what it is. Strenuous effort is needed for its acquisition and practice. The first prerequisite is to cultivate the soul through habits so that it feels joy and sorrow in the right way. That is, the character must already have some affinity with virtue, to love moral beauty and not be able to endure ugliness. If what is natural to each individual is the most important and most pleasant for them, then the most important and most pleasant for a human is a life in accordance with reason, since reason is more than anything else what makes us human. A person who acts in accordance with reason who serves and cares for the mind, is in an excellent mental state and is especially beloved by the gods, since the mind is the most divine thing in a human. Virtue is an individual pursuit. With the power of knowledge, we each find our own equilibrium and decide the way that will attain it. And remember, it's the destination that counts. Don't be disheartened by the missteps you make along the way.